Happy New Year, animators and artists, and welcome to this Toon Boom interview. Katie Renee de Cotre is an animation instructor at Algonquin College who has all, uh, also been working in Ottawa's animation industry since 2012. Her credits include animation on Brickleberry, The Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that, Tangled the Animated Series, Lion Guard, and Wildcrats. We invited Katie to today's discussion to share her experience working as a professional animator and instructor. So, welcome to the stream. Hi, thanks. <laughs> so, Katie, from your point of view, how has Ottawa's animation industry changed over the past nine years? Well, since I've graduated, there's been so much extra work uh, in the last nine years. There's always another show ramping up at another studio, uh, especially now that we've added yet another with Atomic coming to, down, uh, coming to town, Atomic Cartoons. And because of them, a lot of studios, uh, they came offering salary rates and we are finally seeing a shift away from frame rate pay and uh, more shows are being negotiated for salary. So everything feels a lot more stable in general. And that's really nice. Um, we also have uh, a lot more studios taking interest in their employees and their employees' mental health and maintaining a healthy working environment and I think that's making everybody a lot better on the whole, and it's making the ability to produce better work on the whole, and uh, we're finally getting more notoriety in general here in Ottawa, our, our secret animation hub. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so viewers outside of the industry might not realize this, but Ottawa is a major service studio hub for American clients. Was there anything that you learned while working in the industry that surprised you? It really surprised me how laid back the studio atmosphere was. Uh, in school, you know, our, our teachers were fairly laid back in the classroom itself. But getting into the studio and seeing that, like, oh, these are not people in suits and ties. These are people in ripped jeans and full sleeve tattoos and colored hair. And they really they love what they're doing. Uh, that really shocked me because before that, any kind of office job was a distant idea that I, I hadn't experienced. I was very young. <laughs> so, so, so you're going into the interview in like business formal and your uh, hiring manager has like a sleeve of tattoos. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and I was late still. I had taken the wrong bus and didn't get to my first job on time. I had to get a taxi with a couple other people to get to the studio on time. Uh, and they had to train us separately from everyone else who had arrived on time. And it was fine. It, we, you know, they didn't fire us immediately. I was so scared. Where I was like, "Oh no, everything's good. This, this is the worst possible it could have been." And no, it was. It was great. They. Uh, yeah. It was almost better that way. <laughs> the uh, the bus routes from Ottawa to Nepean are also really rough. Oh, it's the. They're just the worst. Even the ones I have to take to. Uh, to teach at the college, there have been times where I'd have to send out an email from my phone going, sorry guys, my bus just didn't show up, so you just start without me and I'll be there soon. I'm, I'm going to start walking. <laughs> Katie, so. do you feel it's important or helpful for animation instructors to continue to work on productions? Oh, ex extremely. Um, it, I think it really helps to uh, keep an eye on exactly how studios are going about their work. Uh, most of our professors at Algonquin College are uh, also part-time teachers in some way. I think besides the coordinators who are full-time, everybody else is also in a studio somewhere. Um, we keep up to date on what's expected in a studio, what, what the pipelines are like, what, how people are using the software. Um, and we try to bring that into our classroom and maintain a more studio-like environment as best we can so uh, they know what they're getting into once they graduate. Uh, and also, I think it helps to keep your skills sharp uh, so that you're better at training students so that you know, like, oh, I animated this today. Oh, I, I should tell the students to watch out for, you know, whatever it is um, and make that make that work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw that you um, uh, are, are sharing a, a, a screen share of uh, yes. a, a classic flower sack animation. Uh, 
exercise, yeah, so I guess. Yeah. Our, our first assignment of the year, I've been preparing the, the demo for that. We're going to have the flower sack do a little head turn just to, to get everybody warmed up again after the Christmas break. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of what my, my streaming setup looks like when I'm teaching in the classroom remotely where I've got a keyboard here off to the side of, I've made a window of that I don't use. I, I, I don't know what the 3D graph is for, but now it's for where my keyboard goes. And whenever I hit a button, it highlights whatever my keyboard is doing so that students can see exactly what I'm pressing and where and why. So that when I say, okay, I'm going to go up the hierarchy and select all this, and move this over, scrunch this down, then we can, um, I can avoid a lot of the questions of, what button was that? What did that press? And I think it's helped. And I'm going to make this demo as we chat, I think. <laughs> it's something I got to do anyway. <laughs> it's a really clever uh, workaround too, having the, the on-screen keyboard. Was that something that you worked out um, teaching during the pandemic or was that something that you worked out previously? Oh, it was something during the pandemic. I found there was a lot of ways I had to get creative in making sure students were being able to follow along with what I was doing. And I thought, okay, there's got to be a better way to showcase what it is I'm doing to them as we're working. Um, and I thought it, it there's got to be a way to have a keyboard on screen. I know, you know, many Twitch streamers have all kinds of layouts. What programs do they use and how can I use that to make this work? Um, so I found a software, uh, uh, OBS or open broadcasting software, I think it is and found a plugin that let me have my keyboard here. And then a separate thing that highlights my cursor so that people know, can have a, keep an easier track of where my little dot is when I'm clicking on my dot, my cursor. That's what it's called. <laughs> there it is. When we were talking earlier, you, you mentioned that one of the things that's really important to you is to make your classroom feel like a studio environment. What are some of the steps that you've taken to get that studio environment uh, feel? I've really tried to, uh, and in general, our program tries to maintain a um, an approval process like we would have in a studio. So every time a student gets to a certain milestone that we, we try to set, okay, this is a two-week assignment, so at the end of this week, you should have X. You should have your keys done, your roughs, whatever. Um, they need to get that approved before they move forward because in the studio, a lot of the time the process goes that you need to do your, your keys first, get that approved by your supervisor, then move on to uh, your in-betweening. Uh, maybe there's another step before lip sync, but that approval process and learning how to get those approvals is so, so important because so many students like to hide at the beginning and not show what they're doing. Um, and in a studio that can't work. That that grinds everything to a halt. If you are hoarding all your scenes and never showing off what it is you're working on, um, then nobody knows where you're at. And the, <laughs> you're animating so that eventually it's gonna show up on TV, so it's not the time to be shy. Yeah. Well, that's a fair point. And also in a studio environment, you wanna make mistakes early. Yeah, now's the time to, like once you're in school, it's definitely, now time to to make that mistake to learn oh if i keep timing it that way that doesn't work or uh oh i'm i'm never labeling things correctly i should learn to label things correctly so people can find my work um yeah. that's a big one label things uh, correctly. i was also thinking too that <laughs> you, you want to get feedback on your roughs so that after you've you know cleaned and colored and composited everything and you show people like oh you know here it is you don't want to hear, well, the timing's off. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want that to, uh, if you catch the mistakes early, then you can fix them quicker. Uh, and it really, students really like to hide that. They don't want to show that process of, but well, what if I made a mistake? It's like, well, good, because now you can learn from that mistake and I can teach you how to continue on from that point. If you don't show me anything, I can't teach you anything. That's that's just how it goes. Has working as an instructor changed the way that you work with colleagues and approach animation more broadly? Yeah, so um, I was always pretty quick at learning the software. 
even in school, I became the go-to person for when whatever software we were using was doing something strange. I just didn't know how to tell them what it was. So I'd say something like, oh, you just have to click the thingy and then move it. And I'd be there and I could show it to them and show them what I mean. But then when it comes to teaching, you got to be way more specific than that. So I learned, you know, oh, I need to tell them, okay, the deformer handle here, move that a certain way as opposed to um, the doohickeys. <laughs> Don't want to call them that. Um, and so the communication aspect, great, that worked a lot better. But teaching the correct way to approach using a build, that changed how I work in the studio, like, uh, so much exponentially. It really made me mindful of other people have to touch my scene after I've done. So if I've animated this in a really stupid way and then compositing gets it or effects gets it after the fact, now they have to decipher how did I get to that point? Um, after being in retakes for a while, you learn that a lot of people have very different styles of animating and some of them are more frustrating to deal with than others uh, in this case teaching students how to do things the correct way really, really opened my eyes to telling other people, oh, okay, wait, you're, you're moving this in this way and you shouldn't. Let me, let me show you how to fix that real quick. <laughs> um, when I'm working in builds, like I, I've got this flower sack build here that uh, student, our students use. And I've tried to make everything as intuitive as possible and labeled correctly so that it's easy for them to use and pick up and, uh, in the studio, you never know what experience level someone's going to have. So you want everything to be as intuitive as possible. Um, and in doing so, I've, I've really found that, like a, a niche in being the harmony specialist in the studio to uh, fix it for however people might find that they, they press something and they're not sure what it did. Um, First years really know how to break stuff, and teaching first years really taught me how to fix stuff. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, <laughs> so, drawing what you just said, um, I, I find that being able to do something visually and then being able to explain it are two very different skills. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I first started teaching, it was such a disconnect for how... I could tell a student had done something wrong, but I wasn't sure what to tell them on how to fix it. Uh, so my my first year teaching was a little bit rough, but I had some really good students who gave me really good feedback on, you know, you just have to tell me to redo the whole part. It's okay, you could say it. You, you don't have to spare my feelings. And you know, finding that balance between telling them something's wrong and being not like, not sugarcoating it, but not being a jerk about it. I have to tell them you're stupid. You did this wrong. It's, Oh, you just need, you need to adjust this arc here. So you need, unfortunately you need to redo this whole part. Uh, show me when you get to this point and I can help guide you so that it, you do it correctly next time. Um, and that made me a, a much better teacher. So. Yeah. And I mean, uh, a big part of that too, is that students are taking these programs to improve and learn. And it definitely made me a way better animator revisiting the basics and teaching the basics year after year. It's made me way more aware of our basic 12 principles of stretch and squash and timing and spacing and follow through and all of that. Uh, just teaching it year after year and going over the basics again and again and again. Um, so for anybody struggling, I really recommend just revisit your basics. <laughs> So you mentioned that um, you'd be like when you were a student, you'd be someone that people would ask for for help using Harmony. Um, when did you first start using Harmony? Was that in class or uh, when you were at a studio? So I first started using it in second year. That would have been 2010. Uh, and we, we had a class called Digital Practice and Principles where the college had computers that had Harmony on them. And they taught us how to use uh, build animation in that. We didn't do anything with drawing initially. It was all just cut out animation and deformers didn't exist back in those days. So uh, it was very much, it was, it was different. 
than it is now. So everything's a lot more intuitive now, I feel like. Um, but it's still, it was so, for me, I struggled really hard in school. And so this was a tool that I could use to animate with where I didn't have to worry about drawing things very consistently. It just worked. Uh, they, the drawings were already there and I could just adjust them to be what I knew it should look like. So that was a, a huge like light bulb moment for me where, oh, I can be an animator. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so in addition to being an instructor at Algonquin, you were also uh, previously a student at the same school. Was there anything from your experience as a student that informed your practice as an instructor? Yeah, so like I, like I mentioned, I struggled a lot with drawing. I was very young. I was 18. I had just graduated high school, and I had been accepted into the animation program. A lot of other, my classmates had already done pre-animation, which is the course that helps uh, prepare you for animation if you don't get in the first time and or they just help you strengthen your portfolio in general for other courses as well and they already had experience with the college atmosphere they'd been there for a year they knew what it was like and I was a very good high school student I knew how to remember things and then regurgitate them and then completely forget about them forever uh and that doesn't work in college. This was stuff I needed to remember forever for my career. So I, when they, you know, they teach the stretch and squash in your first assignment. And that didn't click for me until maybe assignment four or something where I had to struggle so hard with learning these concepts that the workarounds and uh, the ways I had to make it make sense in my brain really helps me figure out, okay, where where's our weaker students going to struggle? Where are our stronger students going to struggle uh, and why? And how can I help them get past that? What can I show them that worked for me back then uh, to fix this problem that they're having? Um, the other thing is that I remember the extremely late nights sitting up at 3 a.m. crying over like, why doesn't the box look right, dad? I don't understand. And my dad just home late comforting me, making me a hot chocolate going, it's okay, sweetie, it's just a box. And I go, but I, I need it to look right, dad. And it would be, you know, I'd, I'd stretched it, but I hadn't squashed it. That was the thing. I just made a weird shape. Um, and so I, it made me a lot more empathetic towards students struggling with not understanding rather than getting frustrated that why don't you just know the thing that I know? It's because it's hard. It's the first time that they're learning it. And there needs to be some amount of sympathy for learning things for the first time. Yeah. I think one of the really amazing things about um, animation is that uh, regardless of what software you're using, um, the principles behind animation have remained fairly consistent since the 1940s. Yeah, we always say, you know, software is just, it's another kind of pencil. Um, you, you work in harmony, you work in 3D, you work on paper. It's all the same principle of some sort. Like you can, you can do it on a sticky note if you want. You can animate anywhere. You can animate on anything. You know, people animate with paint. They animate with sand, clay. You know, it's, it's all, it'll all apply the same way. And they've been as relevant as they were when those old men came up with them. Yeah, and it's also funny too, where uh, there's sometimes misunderstandings because the uh, terms came from so long ago that when people hear solid drawing, they think it means like, hey, it's a good drawing. Yeah. Oh, that's a solid drawing you made right it's there. A solid yeah. Drawing. Rather than like, no, we're, we're referring to the 3D-ness of the shape and how well it goes through perspective. And now you're making me aware that I didn't make this a very solid drawing. <laughs> Let's make that curve around a little harder. We've got a, a round guy here. But the it's, you know, a lot of times I'll refer to like, okay, I've taught them once what an antic, what the anticipation is. I will therefore refer to it as antic after that point. And so I go, okay, here's my antic. And they're like, it's the antics that it's doing? Like it's like it's joking around. It's like, no, it's like a it's like, oh, oh never mind. <laughs> The anticipation drawing is also called the antic. And da, 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 da. Uh, it's, it's fun to see that develop and also frustrating at times. 
Yeah. <laughs> so from your point of view, um, what do students often struggle with the most in animation classes? And what do you find helps? Um, I think the, the principle they struggle with the most is timing and spacing, because that's really hard to know. It's something that's like, it's really hard to teach something that you kind of grow intuitively over time. You have to build up that visual muscle memory of uh, how long an action will take to do something. Like here, I'm already thinking like, well, this is just, it's just these little ears here. I can put like a single frame there. I'll probably put like another one because I like a really slow, slow in at the end. Um, and then I got to make an, an overshoot here. But timing and spacing is like, when you're working on paper, as we usually do in first year, when you're flipping pages back and forth, back and forth, it's hard to get a feel for that timing because you're doing it for the first time. You don't know how these drawings are going to turn out. You know you have to take it over to the line test machine, and that's going to take at least half an hour. So by that point, you you haven't been drawing for half an hour because you've just been filming 100 pages of animation. Uh, and then you get it back and you go, oh, this one drawing is wrong. Oh, good. I'm so glad that now I have to change one singular drawing. Uh, and then you got to go back and fix it. And then you spend another half hour filming it. And then you realize, oh, wait, this whole section is wrong. And so it's just, it's, it's hard to figure it out when it's on paper and you're not, you're still learning how to flip your animation. Um, but moving into a digital space, I can move these around. I can play them back and go, okay, I haven't actually played this back in a while. Is this going to take too long? No, it looks that, that looks okay. I might put a little more time and some spots, but, uh, and then I can go back and fix, okay, you know, or maybe I'm going to push these guys are going to come down and I can change it so quickly now. Um, that it's so much nicer than animating on just sheets of paper. Like I learned. So I think I really struggled with timing and spacing and they really struggle with it. The other thing, um, that I think new students really struggle with is that same thing I mentioned is coming out of high school. Uh, the way that you learn is so different from how you have to learn to think, okay, I need to know this for my career versus I need to know this, write it on an exam and then never think about it ever again. So that was my problem anyway. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny that you mentioned like timing and spacing because that's one of the, more abstract elements of animation, right? Like you can have an individual frame where like as an illustration, there's nothing wrong with it, you know? Like it's it's a beautiful drawing and all the, the volumes are solid and uh, the line work looks really good, um, but it doesn't fit the timing. Yeah, and like it, it's funny to see, uh, and like funny in quotes, but it's funny to see animation fans on Twitter who will take apart a single drawing and say, look how off model this drawing is. And it's like, okay, but in motion that works and looks fine. Like that's just what, that's what that looks like. Um, it's when you start slowing things down frame by frame, like even real videos, you see that like, oh, joints, like sort of the way that the motion blur works, it's different. And that's what we're trying to emulate in animation. It's, you know, if you could do it a live action, why are you doing it in animation? That's why we do it in animation, because we can get away with weird looking things that feel right. And like I always tell my students, if it looks good, it is good. <laughs> That's what you're aiming it, it, for. It's all about the illusion, right? Yeah, it's all because we're, we're tricking people into having feelings for pixels, right? Uh, That's the animation's magic that way. Was there anything that made timing and spacing really click for you? A lot of it was just practice, but mostly it was a moment where I was sitting down with my supervisor at my very first job, and he just goes, I just don't know why your timing and spacing is so weird. And I went, oh, is that what the problem is? My timing and spacing is weird. And I had to think, like, because up to that point, I've been doing a lot of traditional stuff uh, in school, and to think like, okay, how am I in between with the timeline that that's weird? And it was, I was, you know, I'd, I'd pull an in-between from here and I'd put that over here, but I pulled this one and I'd move that too close here. And then these wouldn't work together with whatever I had next. And uh, so I had to really sit down and remember like, what's a time chart and how does that work? And 
Uh, I need to film myself doing things more to get a sense for how long things take because I, I really didn't know. Uh, but building up that, you know, just the time spent building up that visual memory uh, to get that good eye feel, that's really the majority of it. Just experience, which is the worst answer. Just keep doing it. <laughs> no, everyone wants the quick fix and it's really just keep going. If you think you have enough drawings, add like two more. That's probably right. I think part of it too is having the like a clarity of purpose of why you're practicing. Because I, I feel like the, um, the feedback everybody gets is just practice more. But the question is practice more what? Right. You really have to think as you're practicing. Because, and I tell this to new artists a lot where they're like, well, how do I get better at drawing? And it's, you have to think while you draw, why is something this way? Like when you're studying a drawing, you're not just looking for what's the shape doing? It's why is the shape doing this? How is it doing this? What's the perspective on that shape? What is it showing us? Uh, why is the light this way? Why is the color that way? Um, and that's the, the hardest part. It's so like secretly mentally tasking uh, to, to do animation as a job, as a, as a, uh, a student to just have to think all the time you're fully engaged all the time thinking how does it work and why i didn't give this guy a marker Bloop. Bloop. Um, i was going to ask you if you see any trends in the animation industry or the craft of animation more broadly if yeah, I think a lot more studios are taking uh, a traditional approach. Like a lot of people talk about, oh, the death of 2D animation, but you see a lot more TV shows hand drawing things or using hybrid where they have a build and they've hand drawn effects on top of it or something like that. Um, and it's interesting to see jobs I'd only heard about in school, like cleanup artists and whatnot coming back into relevance in a different kind of way where now you're doing it digitally, but. Uh, I've only worked puppetry shows. I don't really know how that side of things work. And rigs are so advanced, it's kind of hard to tell the difference uh, in some cases. I remember telling somebody once, like, uh, they were so convinced Wander Over Yonder was a 2D show. And I had to tell them, no, that was, that's in harmony. Those are rigs. They're just really, really cool rigs. <laughs> they can really do a lot in animation these days. Um, same with the Tangled show. They, uh, a lot of people thought some of those shots couldn't have possibly been in harmony. They were. <laughs> it's very pretty. Um, my hope, though, for the, the trends of the industry, uh, and we're seeing this a little bit more now, is that more kids' television treats them like people. Because I feel like a lot of shows like kind of talk down to kids. Um, and I, I think kids, they learn a lot from the TV what the the TV that they watch and pretending that nothing sad ever happens to anybody sort of leaves them unprepared to to deal with the sad thing. You know, it's it's you don't have to directly say like, you know, your dog's going to die. But you know, something, uh, a metaphor for that would be uh, apt at times. I just think a lot of clients will shy away from that kind of episode these days, though. And that's that's a shame. Yeah. Well, uh, I've seen some artists say that they've gotten feedback like uh, they can't show a character scowling. Yeah, I've definitely worked on shows where they say, like, you can't use the angry eyebrows too much or the kids can't be mad at each other for too long. We have to change this or that line read is too angry sounding. Do we have something softer? And these will be shows that, like, have uh, an active antagonist. But even then, you know, they they have to soften the blow, I guess, because kids can't handle that. That's too scary or, you know, something like that. Or that's too sad when like things, bad things can happen to kids. It's, you know, it sucks, but it does. And it's, it would be nice if the, you know, obviously I'm not expecting TV to be the only thing that they learn from, but, um, you know, it, kids are a lot smarter than I think people give them credit for. And I hope that more TV shows treat them that way. We see uh, a lot of nice things happening with shows like Steven Universe, where they have the uh, the mindfulness episode, where they were 
you know, talking about what, what you do when something doesn't go your way, you have a, a thought that doesn't mesh, etc. Um, how, how you handle that kind of feeling. And I think it would be nice if more shows tried that. Yeah, I think that acknowledging that um, people and children experience negative emotions um, is a very mature and I, I think it's a valuable thing to explore. I hope more shows do it. Like I, I haven't watched a lot of kids animation these days, but the, the shows that I've worked on have very much been like, well, we can't have them hitting each other with pillows. That's violent. The kids have pillow fights though. You know, it's nothing a kid can repeat against another kid, I guess is the, uh, is the idea maybe. Yes. What do you think will be the biggest challenges for animation schools over the next five years? I think that um, I've, I've seen a lot more hobbyists that start to get Toon Boom uh, products of all kinds and try out the software on their own. And there's a lot more like YouTube tutorials on how to use, not only how to use the software, but just how to animate on the 12 main principles, uh, how to apply them to everything. And I, I wonder if, you know, that will steadily become more accessible to people than schools are. Since tuition in general, like everywhere is getting so much more expensive that I think that makes it a lot more inaccessible to more people. Uh, and that's a shame. Um, you don't really get into animation to make money. So that's, that's kind of daunting if you're thinking like, I really want to do this thing I love, but I'm going to have to spend a lot to learn it it might be more appealing to say, well, I can just do some YouTube videos for leave that on for an hour. And now suddenly I'm, I'm an expert, <laughs> um, which, uh, you know, it, it's not the case. It's not quite how it works. Sorry. But um, I'm also a little worried that now that we all have the capabilities that admin at the administration at the schools might push for, online learning as the norm. And I know that's been hard on our students. So I imagine across the board, it's probably seen the same thing. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that made it really hard this year is that the students and teachers didn't really choose online. It just sort of happened to them. Yeah, so they were expecting to go into a classroom and they enrolled in that when they applied. Cause it would have been, you know, at the beginning of the year, I think they have to apply for the spring or the fall semester. Um, so that blindsided us all, you know, as we are all in this unprecedented time, but, uh, I still think that it, going to school and getting that feedback from a real professional professor, uh, would be more valuable than YouTube. <laughs> um, yeah. and, you know, at, at Algonquin, especially we provide the software that they're using. They don't have to buy the software separately or anything. Um, they just have to have their own device to run it on. Yeah, uh, th there are like YouTube videos and tutorials that do a really good job of breaking down the different principles of animation and how to use software. Um, but there is something to having uh, a professional look at what you've done and give you feedback that can help you improve. Yeah, I think that real time feedback is so important. Like when we're in person, that's like the number, like I might spend an hour lecturing and then uh, the next three hours of my four hour class is sitting down with each individual student and going over what they have so far and seeing, okay, did it work? Did, did Are you getting what I'm doing? Here's how to fix your individual animation. And I do that for each and every student um, that on um, whatever they're working on. Sometimes they even show me stuff where they're like, this isn't the assignment at hand, but could you look at this cool thing I made? Um, and we, I get to see what they do in their off time. Some of them do animate in their off time and that's interesting. I don't know how they have time for that, <laughs> but I think getting that like real feedback and that real experience from like, I've been in a studio, here's what it's like. Here's what I can tell you that will be relevant to you, the person be like that one-on-one -on -one time is so, so important. Do you have any guidelines for critiquing animation in a way that helps artists improve? I, I know that um, we're talking about uh, how 
it's very difficult to describe some things that are visual in in words um and critique and feedback also sort of fall into that category too where i'll, I'll see a lot of uh, people comment on animation and say hey that looks really smooth or that works and it's really hard to uh take that feedback and improve yeah it, it puts an animator in this weird spot where uh, if you've done your job right, no one really knows you did anything at all, and that's the goal, but you still want that recognition that you did the thing, because it was really hard to do the thing, probably. Um, so a lot of times it's impressive that you made anything you move at all, so, you know, very smooth, good job. But you don't see that on, say, like a, a television show. They don't go, wow, Steven Universe looks really smooth. <laughs> They comment on the acting, they comment on the characters and what they're doing and how they're feeling and how it made them feel. Um, the other thing though, a lot of people will disguise giving um, feedback on something as a chance to be, say, like honest about it, where they're just kind of mean, where you don't need to tear somebody apart. You could just say, I liked it, or uh, you know, I really liked how you did this one particular thing. Uh, I'm not expecting people to suddenly be able to say, wow, I really like the arc that you've made that, that turn on. Wow, what a nice arc, you know? But uh, I think just being nice to people, just be nice to people. <laughs> it, takes a real, it takes a lot of work to make anything move. Um, this was mostly keyed up beforehand, so you don't get to see that full experience. But even just a little head turn, it's going to take like an hour, maybe, uh, for a first timer to to do. Okay, first timer maybe longer than that. I, I underestimated there. Be nice, but um, that's such a hard question because how how do you tell someone that you like it without just saying it's smooth, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge. Well, you mentioned being kind, and I, I think that's really important, uh, especially because we just got through a really tough year. Um, and, you know, when, like, the largest animation festivals were unable to gather in person, how have you found opportunities to find community online? Uh, really, Discord has been, like, a godsend, uh, where I joined the Toon Boom Discord, because I was looking for support on a thing I'd forgotten how to do and I knew it existed somewhere and I was trying to make a video for a student uh, and I got an answer right away. And then I started to see questions come in where I'm like, oh, I know the answer to that. And I just started hanging around there more and that led me to use Discord more in general. And so now I've got you know groups with just my friends. Uh, our first year students have their own Discord where I could talk to them. Uh, there's the, I also, sorry, I also got involved in the Oats Discord, which is our local uh, animation group kind of thing. Uh, it's the Ottawa Animators Talking Socially, where we, you know, it, uh, industry professionals try to come together to help out students and give them resources for uh, being in the industry and support and feedback on their schoolwork or anything like that. Because before that, you know, like we said at the beginning, we were very secretive. All those studios kind of kept to themselves and nobody knew that Ottawa was this big animation hub and we didn't really act like it. So this has been a great way for uh, industry people to come together and chat more and you know, keep, keep people up to date on what's happening in studios and who needs work and who's looking for jobs where and when we have so much work to go around and so few animators to fill the jobs, we uh, it's, it's nice to have a resource that's you know, keeping that all together. Yeah, uh, it's also funny too because like Ottawa has so much talent. I, I remember going to um, a a pub comic jam event where you know you trade back and forth a piece of paper and draw different panels. And half of the people participating were animators from various studios. Yeah, there's so many of them. Like, I remember when I was first starting uh, to be interested in animation, I told my mom, I want to be an animator. 
uh, after doing like a little bit of 3D in school and she went like, oh no, my child wants to be an artist. Um, and so she started researching it for me and finding that like, oh, our, our neighbors at the cottage are neighbors with the guys who own uh, the Jamfield studio. Our, uh, our other neighbors are friends with people who work in, you know, to do business for Amberwood when that was here. And she started getting me these connections before, like I'd even started just because I mentioned uh, that I wanted to be an animator at all. So thanks mom. <laughs> that was great. We, um, she got me this volunteer position at Mercury where I was scanning layouts and everything. And uh, suddenly I, I learned how, just how many animators there were um, out and about. Even my best friend was like, oh, I, I, I used to be babysat by the guy who owns Pip Animation. And uh, that, was, that was a fun connection too. Seems like everybody knows at least one animator. Yeah, uh, Otto is a fun size where you can you can have a lot of talent there, but it also sort of feels like a small town. You know, you bump into everybody at the Rideau Center. Oh, yeah, and I, I live near the college, so I'm often bumping into my own students and being like, oh, where are you working now? Do you, do you have a job? Do you need a job? I know about a bunch of jobs. Come on to this new job. There's a show starting here. Why don't you apply? Uh, or just running into... I mean, when we were allowed to be outside, uh, there was this one like apartment complex where there just happened to be a lot of animators living there because Mercury was nearby. And that was always very funny to me. It was like a weird animator commune on the, that side of the city. <laughs> so K Katie, we're about uh, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Do you want to uh, give our viewers a tour of your rig? Oh, sure. Um, so he's been like a little bit modified to have this eye line. He doesn't normally have that. So that part's not quite finished, but let's look at his normal self. Um, he's got two main halves of him. He's got his little butt half and his head half. Uh, here, bloop, bloop, bloop. here's his side plane. It can come across and be large or be just a sliver. Uh, I've showed students how to have it, uh, how to duplicate it so he can have two of them in case they need it. But for most cases, they, he can just have the one side. As we go through the different, whoops, not that. There we go. If I go through the different fold drawings, he's got one where he's got this sort of overlay so he can crunch down. It used to be a drawing swap would do that, but now he can have both. He can overlay either way. And there's also, whoop, there's like the more crunched one. If the lines didn't work out with the deformer, I wasn't sure that they would. So I made a whole different drawing swap for that. And then one where there's just nothing for the times where he doesn't have a crease on him. I made all these tags that don't render out at the end um, so that they can more easily click on some of these just lines that are hard to find sometimes. Just wanted to make it easier to use. Each ear and foot has a different color swap. So if it changes sides, it can match the side that it's on. I would have liked to have that like just with the shadow, but then I found that I kept clipping off the edge of it and that didn't work and the foot was kind of a problem. Uh, and I just didn't want to come up with a solution. Just, just having it swap worked. All of his parts had a deformer on them. Uh, because it's it's just easier to pose them that way. I, I figured these are fine with just a single line. They didn't need a whole envelope on them because they're just small pieces. So their their first assignment will be getting this dude to do a little look over. Just let's bring everybody back up to speed, shake off that holiday rust, and uh, get them animating again. They'll be doing it traditionally, but I will be using this one as my demo. Uh, I want to talk more to them about how to think while they draw. So I have this layer here where I'm going to be going over, grabbing a color, and tracking my arcs and everything. Oh, I'm snapping to everything. Hold on. Tool properties, snapping. I've got these lines here to uh, track how tall things get. I try to give my students as many tools as possible to know what they're doing. Just so, you know, someday 
It might not click immediately, but someday they might remember and go, oh, that's what she was talking about. That's the thing that I have at my disposal. I can use shift and trace or I can use the alignment guides or whatever. Um, so I know that happened to me a lot. Uh, I was really bad at lip sync to start with in a studio because we didn't do a ton of it in class. And so then I, it sort of like occurred to me one day, oh, wait, I remember how, how he told us to do lip sync and then shift this over. Oh, wow, this all suddenly works and makes sense. Wow. Did I go on this arc? Arcs are an animation principle. <laughs> so as much as anything else, I just try to give them as many tools as humanly possible so that they're as equipped as they can be before I let them go. And sometimes I have to remember, you know, after me, they still have another two years. We're a three-year program. Uh, and I sometimes take on too much. <laughs> Just get so excited about teaching them harmony. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can see that um, th there's just a lot in a, a very simple rig uh, wh where you have the flower sack and you have the different parts of it and then you have color overrides. Um, oh, yeah, it's, it's a very, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, but then like they're starting to see like different elements of compositing and uh, the, the different parts of the production pipeline. Yeah, and I try to get them to play inside the build like a little bit, like Part of why I didn't want to add a whole extra side plane already or an extra center line uh, in case they had them do a nice twist was that I wanted them to play around inside a little bit. Like this is all way off to the side. They've got tons of space here to copy and paste stuff and play around. So I've left like, here's the center line. Here's the tag for the center line. Here's uh, what, this is the side plane and how that's bigger and, uh, but this part I'm going to have trouble explaining because a, a problem that we were having and I had to troubleshoot after the semester, this build saw a, a lot of change after the end of first semester because he really got stress test by 90 students and things changed when that happens. But I found when they brought it forward, the shadow wasn't staying. You can see I don't have like a great solution happening here, but I've done like a cross auto patch situation where you, it'll keep the shadow on top. So hopefully we won't have to worry about that but I think I forgot to do it for the center line I'm noticing. Uh, so just layering gets, uh, that always confuses students to see that like, oh yeah, actually we're in a 3D space and you have to think about it in a 3D way. That's like the mind blowing part when you open that up in, in class for the first time and they go, whoa, you mean this can move in 3D and it changes? Wow. Love that part. <laughs> our, uh, one of our rigging specialists, Lindsay, uh, just logged in to say that she really loves the rig that you made and oh, uh, finds it's a great idea. Thank you. I'm glad. Uh, uh, Lindsay had a lot of nice things to say about my little deer build that I made, so I want to modify that for being used for the college, too. Um, the, the other thing that Harmony has been super great for is uh, I needed a way to still have a like a, a handwritten notes that students could see. And so I ended up making a digital blackboard that I could, I used a couple functions to be able to turn things on and off. So I had this like, it's a fake chalkboard <laughs> and I was really proud of it where I could really messily draw something and feel more authentic. So I could say, it's chalk, look, it's a chalk texture, right? Look at these textured lines. And I had all these slides about um, the different things we were doing and I could write them out for students. I could write them ahead of time. And I made all these chalk colors in my color palette so that I could uh, still pretend we're definitely at school on a chalkboard and in person except not at all. And I could provide them this file afterwards. So unlike in school, when I would you know, have to erase the chalkboard to give them the next thing, now they had this forever and they had my explanation stored as a live video that I would then go and edit and maybe make little notes on later. But that was, I, I liked that part. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a lot of, lot of fun 
making these. It, it took a lot of extra time, but I think it was worth it. Here's, I did a take last semester. <laughs> it's a great jump. Well, a little spooked guy. <laughs> so thank goodness we could go digital. Uh, we were really not sure what we were going to end up doing for the semester, but uh, after a lot of work and deliberation amongst our curriculum meetings, we, we got something that works mostly. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it is possible to, you know, do animation with a uh, traditional blackboard, but that would take uh, a while longer. <laughs> a lot of uh, a tripod set up, probably uh, a lot of erasing. I guess it'd be like stop motion. I've, I've always been fascinated by stop motion that I think I would just, it would be so frustrating to do. You can't go back and change anything. You're, you just, you did it. <laughs> Katie, this has been a lot of fun. Is there anything that you would like to promote? Uh, nothing personal I'd like to promote, but Algonquin College uh, has just started up having a winter intake as well. So we're going to be having students all year round. So if you ever wanted to apply to animation, just try it. Uh, apply at Algonquin and come on down to Ottawa. Even right now, you can stay in your home and do it from there. Uh, we're a great program. We got a lot of students who get hired out by Disney, by Sony. They work on Nickelodeon shows, on Netflix shows, everything. Uh, we've got really high success rate in our graduates. So come on down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Katie, I want to thank you and everyone for joining us for today's interview. Um, if there are students watching this, you can get a discounted student license for Harmony and Storyboard Pro. Details are at store.toonboom.com slash students. We also can provide institutional licenses for schools, so check with your instructor to see if those are available for you. If any of our viewers want to get feedback for their animation or just participate in a community of artists and animators, I highly recommend joining our Discord server at discord.gg slash toonboom. You can find uh, job postings, helpful tips for using Harmony and Storyboard Pro, um, submit feature requests, and get links to all of the resources that we provide. If you enjoy the show, tune in on Tuesday for a collaboratory with Mike Morris. We'll be improvising another storyboard with uh, our audience, and we need your suggestions. Until next time.